All right. Good morning, everybody. It is eight o'clock uh, central time, so we will go ahead and start um, the first case. Is not a globe, uh, but something interesting anyway. Um, so this is a third eyelid from a 10 year old domestic short haired cat. Um, the history we got was uh, there was a cyst of the right third eyelid uh, that was excised in July of 2020. In April of 2021, both third eyelids were thickened and protruding. Uh, CT was performed at a different facility and showed third eyelid cysts. Fine needle aspirates were made and mild neutrophilic infiltrates with a few reactive macrophages uh, were read out uh, by uh, cytology. And then in January of 2023, uh, the animal returned with markedly thickened slash protruding third eyelids in both eyes that were actually blinding the cat. So they were completely covering the eyes. Both third eyelids continued to thicken. Um, they tried giving intralesional triamcinolone, um, but no effect. Um, so the owner requested third eyelid removal, uh, which was done at the end of March uh, or beginning of April. So we actually received both third eyelids from this cat, um, but I only am going to show you one of them, but they're actually remark remarkably similar. Um, so uh, here it is. So we definitely got uh, two third eyelids that were very chubby. Um, and so in this image, this is a cross section of the third eyelid. So up here is the leading edge. Here's the cartilage right back here at the back. Um, so this is, I think, the palpebral side, although I'm not quite sure. Could actually be the bulbar side. Uh, but anyway, so what we have is a mass of sorts uh, that's sort of off yellow or off white to yellow. And it has these really large cystic spaces that we can see with the naked eye. Um, so I wasn't quite sure what was going on. And the other one looked identical to this grossly. So both of them were markedly thickened and then um, had these large cystic spaces. All right, so I know our sub gross view is kind of annoying because it's not all in focus, but here we go. Uh, so once again, there's the third eyelid, or the, sorry, the leading edge of the third eyelid. And I guess I was wrong about where the cartilage was. It's kind of right in the middle there. Uh, but anyway, uh, so actually both sides of the third eyelid are thickened and expanded by multifocally to maybe coalescing large cystic spaces. Um, some of the cystic spaces have some stuff in them uh, so we'll take a look at what that is. And then the um, spaces between the interstitial spaces are very densely collagenous. So more than likely, there's going to be some fibrosis happening here. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. So we'll just start right here. So. Um, we can see that there's one of those cystic spaces. It has a very clear lining to it uh, that's a little bit ragged. Um, and then there's inflammation. So all of this in, uh, stuff that's in the lumen of this cyst is inflammatory cells. Most of these guys are neutrophils. And then occasionally we'll get some macrophages in this one in particular. The epithelium itself is a little bit hard to um, figure out the morphology of. We'll go look at a better example of that in another one of these uh, cystic things. And then also <clears throat> adjacent to that cystic thing, there's a lot of inflammation. So there are plasma cells, um, neutrophils, lymphocytes, et cetera. So let's go look at a different spot real quick. I like this one right down here. Is not centered. So here's a, a nicer area to look at the epithelium. So it is, um, it varies from being stratified squamous, which is what it looks like right here, to maybe being a little bit cuboidal to columnar, right up over here. Maybe right here in this exact spot, you can picture it being a bilayer, but that's not always consistent. And then we have um, these big cells here. So these guys are macrophages that are sitting adjacent to the cyst or kind of just under the epithelium. 
and they're very vacuolated. So they might have some lipid in their uh, cytoplasm. And then in the lumen, you can see that there's a bunch of those neutrophils and a lot of these big guys who are either the same macrophages or they could be some sloughed epithelial cells. Maybe the big foamy ones are probably macrophages. I thought this was inter an interesting spot because they actually look like they're coming either right from the epithelium or right through it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, um, so there's basically, we have a really severe um, pyogranulomatous and lymphoplasmacytic adenitis and conjunctivitis um, of the gland of the third eyelid. Um, I think, and it's hard to really prove that, but I think these big cystic things are dilated ducts. So we have severe ductular ectasia, and then we have inflammation in the duct lumen, as well as inflammatory cells infiltrating the epithelium of the duct of these ducts. Um, so we have some dokitis. So that's the fancy doctor word for inflammation of a duct. Um, so let's just take a look. And then, as I said, at lower mag, there's quite a bit of um, dense collagen uh, between these cystic things. Um, and so that is consistent with fibrosis, which is really just really long-term uh, inflammation or associated with very long-term inflammation. And then occasionally we can find some remaining asini of the gland of the third eyelid. So most of those asini are completely gone, um, but here are some that are still hanging on. And besides the inflammation around them, they look okay. So those are some typical asini of the gland of the third eyelid. So I did bug stains. Um, I did a PAS stain for fungus on both third eyelids, and I did an acid fast stain on one of them just to look for acid fast bacteria. And I couldn't find any microorganisms anywhere <laughs> um, in these uh, in the tissue. Um, so this is a really weird lesion. I've never seen it before. Dr. D said he'd never seen it before. Um, and then the fact that it's bilateral is really weird because you might be able to think like, oh, well, I mean, I guess if it's bilateral, maybe it is some sort of autoimmune thing that started out as destruction of the gland of the third eyelid, similar, similar to what we see in some cases of KCS in dogs. Um, but dogs never do this. <laughs> They just like atrophy. You might have some mild ductular ectasia with a little bit of inflammation, but nothing as severe as this. Um, and the fact that it's bilateral, I guess, is, is just so weird. Um, I wondered if this could be something similar to, um, so in cystic fibrosis in humans, you get, um, it's more of a problem with the cilia function, I think. So you get dilation and um, accumulation of secretions in all kinds of organs, including like the pancreas and the lungs is the one that we most know about. Um, but then this cat is apparently healthy in every other way. So that's probably unlikely. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I thought this was just a really unique case. It does um, have that uh, look of like bronchiectasia, like you see here. Lungs like mycoplasma, maybe. Mycoplasma. Yeah, something like that. I wondered about mycoplasma. Yeah. I I didn't include that in my comment, but like maybe, mm -hmm. you know, like something has totally paralyzed all the cilia. Although then I'm like, uh, do the ducks even have cilia? I can't remember. Right. I don't remember. I don't think they do. No. Um. So anyway, just a really strange thing, and like maybe I could see maybe one eye having suffered some sort of like injury, like caustic chemical or something that would have occluded the outflow tracts, like the little pores where the ducts empty onto the um, conjunctival surface, but we have it bilaterally and the cat's both its eyes are completely normal. Um, so, which is really actually amazing in and of itself yeah. that this glandular issue didn't lead to corneal disease. <laughs> uh, but anyway. So here's what I have here. Um, and ultimately the final word there is that it's idiopathic and I have no idea why. Um, so yeah, just a really strange lesion. Anyone has any insight, please share in the chat. All right. Any questions, additional comments? All righty, let's move on to the next one. Another cat. Um, <clears throat> this is 
the right eye from a 15 year old domestic long haired cat. The history we got was this eye has anterior uveitis, iritis, and retinal detachment. The other eye is normal. And uh, the other medical history we got is good for the age. So it, it is a 15 year old cat, might have some old age issues going on there, uh, whatever those may be. Um, so here is the eye and um, so here's our eye. So here's the cornea up at the top. Um, the iris itself is a little bit off white, maybe a little bit pale for what it should be, although we don't really know what color it started out as. But it's also quite thickened. So the iris is thickened in both uh, sides of the globe, um, but it's a little more prominent over here. Here's our lens looking relatively normal. And then we have a brown mass here uh, in this ciliary body and heading into the choroid here. And then we also have this off-white mass that has some areas of at least hemorrhage. Uh, sometimes, well, blood can turn brown when it's fixed in formalin. So it's hard to say whether this brown here is due to hemorrhage or something uh, like part of this neoplasm over here, or whether this is all the same neoplasm with areas that are poorly pigmented or what. But um, so this is just a really kind of a cool case. All right, so there's our cornea. Cornea is relatively unremarkable. Um, as I said, the iris leaflets are quite thickened and um, there's quite a bit of purple in there. So purple equals hypercellularity. So we'll have to take a look and decide why it's purple. Uh, we're gonna zip over here to this side of the eye. So there's that brown mass that we saw grossly in the gross photo. And it's uh, relatively well delineated. It's poking up into the uh, posterior chamber and vitreous, vitreal space. Um, it does stop short of the iris, so it's not actually affecting the iris. It's in the ciliary body and the choroid. And then as we move further back, um, this is actually the optic nerve right here. Um, and then here's that area, that that mass that was less uh, well pigmented and had these those large areas of sort of off-white discoloration or color to that to it. And then you can see that there are areas of hemorrhage within it. So we have um, at least from low mag view. And then and there's quite a uh, delineation between those two masses or between those two areas of what we're looking at. Um, and then also what we can see at low mag is that all of these pink areas are areas of um, uh, necrosis. And so when you have this sort of patchy area where you have a lot of pink and you have some purple little islands, that is an example of survival around blood vessels. So that's usually an indication of a fairly fast growing um, aggressive neoplasm that's outgrowing its blood supply. <clears throat> All right, so the cornea was boring, so we're gonna ignore it. Um, we'll just jump right into this uh, pigmented neoplasm here. So from low mag, the, um, wow, the camera really washes out the pigment. <laughs> it's way, way more brown through the microscope. Uh, but as we get closer, you can see that there's quite a bit of pigment here. Uh, each cell has lots and lots of cytoplasmic pigment, which is characteristic of a melanocytic neoplasm. The other thing we can see um, as we get higher is that the cells themselves, actually some of these are probably necrotic. Let me see if I can find a better area. The cells themselves are actually fairly bland. Um, so we're not seeing really big nuclei. We're not seeing really big cells. Um, they all seem to be fairly well pigmented. Um, you can see some of the nuclei probably have prominent nucleoli, uh, which is kind of characteristic of melanocytic neoplasms, whether or not they're uh, malignant or benign. Um, but what I'm getting at is that this looks like a fairly benign melanocytic tumor. And if this were a dog, uh, we would definitely call it a benign melanocytoma, um, and this would not be a threat to the animal's life. However, in cats, uh, when it looks like this, and it affects primarily the ciliary body and the choroid, um, with these relatively bland cellular features, this is still a malignant tumor, and it can lead to metastasis. Um, there's a project out there that has yet to be finished uh, to look into that a little bit more thoroughly, uh, but just because it looks benign doesn't mean that it is. Uh, in a cat, pretty much any 
melanocytic tumor in the eye has metastatic potential. Um, anyway, so, and we call these atypical melanomas, feline, feline atypical melanomas. So let's move into that other area of the mass. This is a great area right here. So here, the morphology of the cells is very different. If nothing else, you can obviously tell that there's no pigment here. Um, and then what we really have here is more of a round cell neoplasm. The cells have mm, variably distinct cell borders and some vacuolated cytoplasm. And in this field alone, I can see a bunch of mitotic figures. So here's one. I think that's one. This might be one. Um, and then sometimes you get these bigger cells with uh, a large amounts of foamy cytoplasm, which are probably macrophages. Um, so this is much more consistent with around cell neoplasm. And I really think that this is lymphoma. Um, and so I think this poor unfortunate cat has two malignant neoplasms in its eye. Um, and uh, we haven't done the IHC on it to prove that those are not melanocytic cells, but I really doubt that they are. Um, so the distribution of the round cell population in this eye, it is affecting the choroid, probably effacing the retina. It unfortunately extends right into the optic nerve, right to the uh, margin there. So this is a dirty optic nerve margin. And um, it also is affecting the iris. So the iris on this side, I think, is affected by the same neoplastic cell population. And so what I'm trying to get you to picture in your mind is the word circumferential. So this is a neoplasm that's circumferentially affecting the eye. And Dr. D taught us that equals post-traumatic, quote unquote, or these days, the lymphoma variety, we started calling more post-chronic uveitis, uh, which sometimes can be related to trauma and cataract. But um, in this case, I think there was a cataract, but I didn't, there was no lens capsule rupture. The cataract actually, no, it's pretty, well, it's pretty mild if there is one. Um, anyway, so there's no cataract here, or very mild cataract. So it's probably not the cause of uh, <clears throat> the inflammation that's in this eye. The other iris leaflet is affected by more uh, typical inflammation. So we have a bunch of lymphocytes and some plasma cells on the surface or in the, in the stroma and then some inflammatory cells on the surface as well. Um, so anyway, uh, this is a pretty cool case, not for the cat, um, but as a pathologist, I'm gonna call it cool. Um, so I can't help myself. So um, I, this is a presumed intraocular collision tumor um, or collision tumors, or, and I might be using the wrong word there. We had this debate uh, not long ago, uh, but anyway, so an atypical feline uveal melanoma uh, with clean margins. And then um, there's a large cell lymphoma, possibly post-traumatic slash post-chronic uveitis lymphoma um, that unfortunately has dirty optic nerve mar margins, which indicates that um, unfortunately the neoplastic cells might be um, <clears throat> colonizing that optic nerve and heading right up to the brain. I don't know how often that actually happens, but it can happen. Um, anyway, so, um, I don't really know much about the, I can't really say much about the pathogenesis of this case in particular, but as I said, that, that circumferential involvement of the round cell part of this neoplasm, um, or population of neoplastic cells is really, really strongly suggestive of the post chronic uveitis lymphoma. Um, so this cat may have had some smoldering uveitis for a long time, uh, might be due to some sort of infectious disease. Um, he did not say that any infectious disease testing had been done. Um, and, uh, that, uh, we think that that eventually can on, in some instances lead to malignant transformation of the lymphocytes in the eye. And then this round cell, um, or lymphoma basically. Um, and the post-traumatic lymphomas can be either um, T or B cell. Um, I think most of them are B cell, but that's not unusual. Most lymphomas in cats, at least, are B cell lymphomas anyway. Um, and so, yeah. So it'd be great to get some follow-up on this patient, but who knows if we ever will. What I like about this in terms of like being a collision tumor, which I definitely agree, is the fact that the melanocytic portion of it is um, what we call the atypical variant of the of the feline 
you know, not of non-acidic sugar, which tends to be much more well delineated than the feline diffuse iris melanoma, uh, the, 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 the classic type. And it, you can definitely see that with the fact that the melanocytic population was mostly on the ciliary body and the choroid, and none of the iris defects were affected by the melanocytic population, making less likely that the other round subpopulation is a, you know, it's melanocytic too, so excellent case. That could cause like a smoldering uveitis for a while and then the one I don't usually think of straight retinal detachment as causing inflammation, but right. the tumor, the, the melanocytic tumor, maybe. Yeah, with necrosis and release of yeah. chemical mediators and yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, may differentiate between this kind of lymphoma and just like metastatic lymphoma because wouldn't you expect metastatic lymphoma to also be a lymphoma, or you wouldn't expect to? Yeah. So to repeat the question, um, how to differentiate a post-traumatic quote-unquote or post-chronic uveitis lymphoma from a garden variety metastatic lesion, and so um, this circumferential involvement, which is why I said that word a bunch of times because Dr. D drilled it into my head. Um, that it's the circumferential involvement that is it's it's true not just of the the lymphoma variety of this but also the post the spindle cell variant. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you let those uh, lens epithelial tumors go long enough, they will circumferentially efface the uvea, fill up the globe, and eventually head out of the eye. Okay. Um, so that is that's one of the main reasons why I think this is the post traumatic variety of the lymphoma. Um, so yeah. Yeah, as far as systemic disease, that's a clinical definition. I got to do a systemic workup. Um, it, regardless, I think, of the type of lymphoma, if it's presuming trilocular, you know, presumed ocular primary, presumed ocular lymphoma, or presumed solitary ocular lymphoma, that's what I'm trying to get, or a, the, the post traumatic variant, so let's put it that way. Those are lymphocytes, neoplastic lymphocytes, and they have an inherent capacity of spreading, you know? So um, if you find systemic disease, it's something like that. It could be that the post-traumatic lymphoma is spread, um, or if you get the more regular type of lymphoma, pretty hard to tell if it's, you know, if, if it's systemic already, if it's pretty hard to tell if it's a primary ocular that's spread or the other way around. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, next case, then, uh, if there aren't any other comments. Um, so this is the right eye from a magnificent tree frog, scientific name Latoria splendida. Uh, I just thought that was cool. Um, well, you should have put a picture of the frog there. Oh, I could have. Uh, I strongly encourage Googling. He's very cute. He has cute. a hat. Yeah, he's he's magnificent, you might even say. Magnificent. Uh, <laughs> splendid. <laughs> yes, magnificent and splendid frog. Uh they do look pretty cool. Um, so the basic history is that there was a many month long history of progressive uh color change in the cornea um that progressed to complete corneal opacity. Uh the eye appeared to be enlarging on this side, and then the left eye also started to develop some pinpoint foci. Um, for many months, this uh, cornea didn't really bother the frog, but uh, close to the time that this was removed, uh, it began to rub at the eye and uh, seem uncomfortable. Um, so uh, we'll look at the gross image first. We're looking at the eye from the front, uh, quote unquote, through the cornea, uh, if you will. Um, but the cornea is completely opaque. It's got a very irregular kind of lumpy, bumpy looking surface. Um, it's mostly a, a white opacity, um, but at the edges, you can see this sort of red-brown color change as well. Um, and so that's basically what I'll show you there. And let's switch to the histo. Okay. Um, so we have one section of the eye here. Um, you can see already from low magnification that this cornea is not so much pink as it is sort of like a ghostly 
pale pink white, um, which is not the normal appearance for corneal stroma. Um, and we also have some business or sort of hypercellularity at the edges here and kind of in the middle there. So we'll take a- Works so well for small globes. Yeah, right. Now we can keep everything in focus on the <laughs> subgrowths because it's smaller and it fits right in the middle. Uh, <laughs> All right, so we flipped completely around. Let me find the section I like better. Um, but it's the same section. Um, so we're start, gonna start by dropping in on this area that's pretty hypercellular on the edge. Um, so uh, let's parse what cells we're seeing here. Um, firstly, we have that little blush of red. Um, and when we look closer, those are erythrocytes. So there's a little bit of stromal hemorrhage in this frog. Um, because this is a frog, uh, you can see that the red blood cells are nucleated and oval shaped, which is pretty neat. Um, but uh, a lot of the other cells are mostly lymphocytes and macrophages. Um, you can also see kind of at the edges of this field, um, in between these cells, there are a lot of acicular clear clefts, um, pretty sharply demarcated. Uh, acicular just means needle shaped. Uh, so these clefts are most commonly seen uh, with cholesterol deposits, basically the spaces where cholesterol was or cholesterol crystals. I should say specifically. Um, you can see more of them here, these acicular clefts. Um, and the macrophages often are multinucleate giant cells. You can see a couple of examples through here. When we look closer at the macrophages, uh, you can see, uh, okay, I like that field good. Um, you can see that the cytoplasm is laden with many of these very, very small, very sharply demarcated uh, vacuoles, clear vacuoles. Um, and that sharp demarcation uh, is consistent with a lipid in the cytoplasm of the cell. Do we have a oh, we do have a higher. Good. Ah. So we have. Yeah, we could have. Definitely see that exactly. uh, yeah. It's like directing the movement. That's right, yeah. Uh, so yeah, all these nice, very crisply demarcated sort of micro vacuoles, very pretty. Um, so uh, these are very lipid uh, rich macrophages and they're associated with all of these cholesterol clefts. So this is um, a lipid keratopathy in this frog. Uh, in addition, there's a background of sort of more general inflammation, mostly lymphocytes and maybe some uh, neutrophils on occasion. Um, and so there's a little bit more to be seen with this frog's cornea. As we kind of move along the epithelium here, we should eventually hit, here we go, this little focus here. Um, so we have a really tiny focus of ulceration here, and the epithelium adjacent to that ulceration is sort of uh, poorly attached. Uh, there's a loss of basal layer polarity, meaning uh, over here, you can see that the uh, basal epithelial cells line up nicely, the nuclei kind of line up nicely. Um, in this detached segment, though, there's a loss of that polarity along the deep edge. Um, and there's also formation of intraepithelial eddies or whorls. So these sort of whirlpools of epithelium. Uh, the epithelium has kind of lost its way. It doesn't have anything to grow on anymore. Um, so this is actually an indolent ulcer, which is kind of neat. Indolent ulceration in a frog. Uh, and deep to that ulcer, we see a little bit more of that uh, non... Well, there's still a lot of lipid and cholesterol, but um, a little bit more of that uh, background of... Uh, general inflammation with lymphocytes and necrotic debris and things like that. So um, this frog had a bit more of a complicated corneal disease. Uh, the last thing to show in terms of that complicated corneal disease is if we follow Decimase membrane here, we'll go to the edge. Um, we've got dissection of Decimase membrane away from the posterior corneal surface, and we know it's real. We've got this stromal reaction along the deep edge here, these reactive spindle cells. Um, so decimase membrane ruptured and dissected away from the cornea, and uh, that is the most likely cause of this sort of pale uh, color change in the corneal stroma, and you can see the stromal fibers, but they're pretty widely separated by this clear space. Um, so this is a pretty severe corneal edema on top of everything else. Um, those are sort of the main things to show with this cornea. So the diagnoses are here. Um, so with respect to lipid keratopathy in frogs, it's pretty uh, common uh, in captive frogs of various species. 
Um, it's not quite known what is the cause. Um, they'll develop this progressive corneal opacity and lipid deposition in the cornea, um, which is presumed a primary uh, condition. I think that it's been connected to all cricket diets. It's uh, been sort of overrepresented in female frogs versus male. Um, so like, there's a couple of correlations that have been made, but as far as I know, no distinct or definitive uh, causation has been established uh, as to why these frogs get this progressive lipid keratopathy in captivity. Um, but presumably something to do with diets or uh, not completely understanding their uh, needs in captivity as is uh, unfortunately so often uh, our struggle with exotic species. Um, this frog though did have a much more complicated uh, corneal disease as well with the de uh, destinase membrane rupture and dissection and edema and the indolent ulcer with associated inflammation. Um, so just some bonuses or extras as well as the lipid keratopathy that was there. Um, uh, we did a bunch of special stains, I'll add, uh, including uh, acid fast, just to make sure we weren't missing mycobacteria. Um, and uh, none of those picked up on any microorganisms, nor did we see any on H&E. Um, but it was worth doing it because it was a little bit more complicated than just your basic lipid keratopathy in a frog. Um, that's about it. Okay. If there aren't any questions or comments, I'll do the next one. Uh, so. Oh, I had one quick thing. Oh, go for it. Always good to um try to rule in or out mycobacterial infection yes. in amphibians. You may have said that. I can't remember. Sort of, but I think not overtly. Yeah. Um, it, it's a problem in um some collections of amphibians. Uh, mycobacteria is, um, and it can be really, really hard to manage and or get rid of. Uh, so it's definitely good to run your your acid fasts. Um with those big macrophages even. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, this is a six-year-old spade female Siberian husky. Um, we've got the right eye, history of chronic glaucoma for greater than a year, um, but they described significant pink tissue filling the anterior chamber. Um, multiple ulcers, some other corneal stuff, bufalmia, uh, Goniosky, the fellow eye was within normal limits. Uh, the other eye is blue and this eye, they said blue with a question mark. Um, probably hard to tell with all the stuff that's going, going on, excuse me. Um, and they note at time of enucleation, they were worried about possible extension of this pink tissue down the optic nerve. Um, so something to pay attention to. Uh, so on our gross view, um, we've got the cornea up here. It's a bit of a peripheral section through the cornea, but it's still there. Um, and we've got uh, the uveal tract, which is pretty much diffusely, if variably, uh, thickened by this sort of off uh, white tan tissue, at least after fixation, uh, sort of tan, um, throughout, basically throughout the uveal stroma. Um, there's also these giant cavitated spaces in this tissue, which is interesting. Um, there's a bit of a cataract, there's retinal detachment. Um, you can see this kind of uh, lo low pigment fundus. Um, so uh, this supports that this eye was originally blue, which is uh, useful and important to know. Uh, so we'll take a look at the histology. Okay. The subgrowth is going to be basically impossible. This is a large cassette or uh, slide, but I will do my best. A little bit bigger than the frog's eye. Um, so we have that uh, slice of cornea to our left uh, again. Um, and the uveal tract is very, very distorted um, by uh, lots of purple, so lots of cells. Uh, again, there are these big cavitated spaces which are kind of interesting. Um, and so it's affecting the iris, it's affecting the ciliary body, and even the choroid is thickened. And then we have this very suspicious hypercellularity, uh, indeed traveling down the optic nerve and also out here in the orbital connective tissue. Uh, so let's take a look a little closer. All right, where are we? Okay, so once again, the globe has flipped completely 180 degrees to orient you, and now our cornea is on our right. Um, so here we have this really distorted iris. You can still make out that it kind of is or was iris because you can still see the iris pigmented epithelium along the back of it there. 
Um, but even that is sort of coated along its surface by these uh, abnormal cells. And when we look at these cells, there are sort of these short intersecting fascicles of spindle cells. Um, they are showing some interesting features, though. Oftentimes, they can be somewhat bland, relatively speaking, <laughs> um, with uh, not too much pleomorphism. Um, but we'll show you some other areas, too. Uh, they also do this weird thing where they're sort of developing almost an epithelioid morphology, uh, kind of butting up against those big cavitated spaces. Um, oftentimes, wherever they hit the edges of the eye, too. So I'm going to travel here where they're kind of coating the back of the cornea. Um, they're developing this sort of epithelioid morphology almost along the surfaces. Uh, there's necrosis in this neoplasm, which is interesting. See here a little bit more because there's a delay. Oh, there's a delay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there are these areas of necrosis. Uh, so here's necrosis here, basically just complete replacement by eosinophilic and karyorectic necrotic debris. Um, and then the neoplastic cells are actually doing this interesting uh, feature of palisading along the edges of the necrosis. Um, granted, some of those could be macrophages responding to the necrosis, but a lot of them uh, are, um, epithelial, are the neoplastic cells. Um, we can do another close look at these cells since there may have been a bit of a, a delay at looking at them closer. Um, we'll head back to the choroid now. So especially back here, uh, some of these cells are quite plump uh, and fairly pleomorphic, um, especially compared to the cells we just saw up in the anterior uvea. Um, and then the other thing is that this is certainly quite an invasive tumor, uh, apart from it facing the entire uveal tract. Uh, it is extending into the optic nerve meninges uh, to available optic nerve margins. Um, it's in, in the optic nerve parenchyma itself. And uh, it's out here in the orbital connective tissue as well, uh, reaching available margins. Um, so uh, this is a blue-eyed dog uh, with a spindle cell tumor that uh, is centered on the uveal tract, particularly at least the morphologic features, uh, minus maybe some of the weird epithelioid morphology things that it's doing up there, um, are pretty consistent with a certain diagnosis, which I will now put up here. Uh, uveal schwannoma of the blue-eyed dog, uh, aka, uh, I think kind of an older term before it was spindle cell tumor of the blue-eyed dog. Um, so, uh, but this one is a little bit different. Oftentimes with uh, uveal schwannomas and blue-eyed dogs, we'll just see it in the iris. Um, it may even be like so, uh, like minimally distorting the iris that it's hard to see from low magnification histologically. And then you have to drop in and see like it's a little bit of a busy iris and recognize that there's some spindle cells in there that shouldn't be. Um, in this case, though, the entire uveal tract is a face. It's exhibiting some uh, odd morphologic features uh, and that increased pleomorphism. Um, so we ended up calling this uveal schwannoma with uh, uh, malignant features. Um, the reason being that we wanted to um, highlight what we think that the origin of this tumor is. Um, it's probably still a similar origin, just uh, showing some uh, somewhat unusual features for the diagnosis. Um, I believe some people would probably prefer to call like a malignant schwannoma, uh, basically just peripheral nerve sheath tumor or nerve sheath tumor. Um, but uh, I think this diagnosis better reflects what we think is going on in this eye. Um, so uh, that is uh, that. And uh, typically the prognosis for uveal schwannoma is, is thought to be quite good, um, especially the ones that are kind of just in the iris. You completely excise it. Uh, it's not thought to be um, something that would threaten the life of the dog. Um, there have been suspected metastatic cases of some schwannomas, though. In a case like this, uh, with what we're seeing, we would be a little bit more concerned that this could be uh, threatening to the animal, um, in particular also with the incomplete margins, uh, very concerning. So um, yeah, that's this case, very unusual presentation. Um, all right, any more to say? And I will... Okay. Hey, Andrew here, my first case. Uh, let me see which. Okay. 
I have an 11 year old Maine neuter Shih Tzu dog. Um, we received, I think, a right eye. And um, there's a very long history here, and I will give you some of the highlights. So, yeah, there's no reason to be around the bush. So, I concerned for a multiple myeloma or a plasma cell tumor. Patient has hyperglobulinemia, which is monoclonal, and also has Best Jones protein. Couldn't get a better history for what uh, we thought was going on here. The patient has been treated for an ocular infection and developed glaucoma. Um, yada, yada, yada. Um, it also has a presumptive diagnosis of precursor target immune mediated anemia. And again, as they said, a possible secondary, that, that is possibly secondary to the multiple myeloma. Um, to make things worse, or more complicated, um, the patient also has a recent history of systemic hypertension and mild left atrioventricular enlargement with mild pulmonary venous enlargement. Again, it could all be uh, uh, associated with, you know, uh, what we're going to talk about here. Uh, you guys are probably putting together a compelling history of the diagnosis already, but um, yeah. So anyway, the dog developed glaucoma and the eye was enucleated. And as you can see here, uh, here's the gross image. We have the cornea eyelids, or the eyelid aperture right there. Um, and throughout the eye, all the chambers are filled with this dense uh, white to tan gelatinous material, both in the anterior chamber posterior chamber of vitreous and the subretinal space. You turn your imaginoscope on, you can kind of follow this linear structure here in the back. So this is likely the detached retina. There's hemorrhage, some organizing hemorrhage. And if you follow the melanin pigment, you would be following the uveal tissue. So iris, ciliary body, and choroid. The optic nerve is somewhere over there where we can't see it. Here's the subgrowth. Our histotax did an excellent job finding the optic nerve. We can see the optic nerve right there. If you go back to the front of the eye, here's the eye, uh, the eyelids, sorry. Beautiful section of the eyelid aperture with both uh, are sampling a beautiful meibomian gland right there at the tarsal plate. Uh, we have a section of the third eyelid, section of the cornea, and of the intraocular structure. So just uh, pay attention on how much of this uh, dense eosinophilic homogeneous proteinaceous material it's all around. Uh, grossly, you could see that a lot of that was basically filling up all the ocular chambers. And one of the things that happened during processing is some of that gets lost, you know, especially blood or protein like that. And depending on how dense the protein is, there's a contraction of that um, congealed protein, let's put it that way, or the congealed material. So that's why you have this separation, but it was uh, diffusely filling up all the chambers. In the back, we got the optic nerve and um, Again, not easy to recognize the retina, but you can see that there is a linear tissue extending from the shoulders of the optic nerve right there. So we could assume that some of that is retina, so detached retina and hemorrhage, fibrin. Uh, again, you know, a joke, we're going to be playing the 50 shades of pink here. So there's pinker, pinkish, red, magenta, you know, so... Let's take a closer look at it.
12. Excuse me, I'm gonna turn this around. Because I have a problem. Okay, so again, eyelid margin, beautiful section of a meibomian gland. See some of the cautery artifact from the surgery. Now we're moving into the eye. We've got the cornea right away. That cornea is not normal. There is a large area of axial corneal ulceration. And you can see, I like this region right here. There's a hyper eosinophilic portion of this cornea. And you can see the cornea is acellular. And also this front line of neutrophils that get to that area, but they don't infiltrate that area. So that suggests corneal necrosis or a corneal sequestrum. Right, so, mark, so potentially mark the exposed cornea in that area. There is a vascularization of the peripheral corneal stroma. And again, that proteinaceous material accumulating everywhere. It is pretty. It wants to do things. It wants to be something like asteroid hyalosis, but it's just protein, right? Um, that probably suggests just a dense, um, you know, uh, pro you know, pro proteinaceous exudate of a, a high density. Uh, there's some red blood cells, but you can see that not a lot of them. Uh, it's mostly just protein. If we move around a little bit more, Take a quick look. There is a periodal fibrovascular membrane causing ectropinuvia and a little bit of a peripheral angiosinicia or at least collapse of those periodal corneal angles. More of that dense protein, similar situation affecting the other iris leaflet. Um, very repeatable pattern of hemorrhage and dense protein issues. Actually, it gets very almost solid. Uh, as, as you could see, it was very gel-like um, on subgrowth. Uh, if we move around, getting to the ciliary body, there are areas where the ciliary body epithelium is kind of lost. So degeneration and or potential necrosis, that same proteinaceous exudate in the subretinal space. Um, we're moving closer to the optic nerve. So here it is. You go one lower magnification so you get a better view of it. So optic nerve, markedly gliotic, um, maybe some atrophy, and you can see the retina going out of the optic nerve. Um, and right away, you lose some of that retina, or you basically are not able to recognize the retina anymore. Um, and what you end up with are this linear structures with some Free floating vessels here and there, so potentially some necrotic retina, and adjacent to it, a little bit different, you know, of the other shades of pink that we've been talking right now, so so far. So we got a lot of hemorrhage, and it's organizing, almost like you can use your imaginoscope to see some of those concentric layers, um, and dissecting between you get fibroblasts. Some macrophages, some fibroblasts, and here and there, you know, vessels. So this is what we call a fibrinoproliferative lesion. Um, you can see how it, you know, those vessels and fibroblasts interact with that hemorrhage. Okay. Moving peripherally, the retina becomes a little bit more apparent again. Another feature, if you look in some of these vessels, inside the vessels, you have a similar, similarly dense proteinaceous exudate in the lumen of some of these vessels. Um, and that will go back to uh, tie it up together later. If we now move to or towards the optic nerve, just to wrap things up. Take a look at some of the larger vessels in the choroid. Then we have 
some of that similar proteinaceous exudate. Some, some of it is a little bit more fibrin, um, but it's a similarly dense intravascular component of that proteinaceous exudate. But what we don't have, we do have a lot of the smaller vessels, but we don't have an obvious um, thickened uh, vessels with thickened walls and uh, obviously hypertensive uh, or hypertrophic vasculopathy that suggests uh, hypertension right away. So all the features that we've shown so far are strongly suggestive, and especially with the clinical history of uh, hyperviscosity syndrome. Right, so we have we, we do have a suspicion of a multiple myeloma. We have hyperglobulinemia. What else? Lance Jones protein, a monoclonal gammopathy. So everything kind of fits with the hyperviscosity syndrome. And what we're seeing here are the consequences of you know the hyperviscosity causing um, um, kind of sludging of the blood and hemorrhage and necrosis of the tissue. This is a, um, yeah, I should have shown this a little bit better. This is a little better example of a, a fibrinor proliferative lesion, which is this um, you know, longstanding hemorrhage with organizing. It's kind of like an intraocular organizing hematoma in a way. Um, for a long time, we uh, strongly associated uh, the presence of this uh, fibrinor proliferative lesions with systemic hypertension more likely than not, but we have seen similar lesions with other um, chronic intraocular hemorrhage type diseases and other types of vasculopathy. So um, not only systemic hypertension, but other uh, you know, uh, lesions associated with chronic hemorrhage and other vasculopathies can cause kind of like this. One thing that we don't have uh, that's not very prominent in this case that we often see with hyperviscosity syndrome is tissue necrosis, right? One, one of the features of the disease is you know, a slow of the blood flow and, and uh, ischemia, like peripheral ischemia. Um, so we could see areas of ciliary body or iris necrosis and retinal necrosis. There is retinal necrosis, of course, right? Some areas we lose it, but um, I think in this case, is we're thinking more of the anterior uvea, for example. But that doesn't you know, uh, preclude us from reaching a diagnosis here because everything else fits perfectly. Okay, so diagnosis, hyperviscosity syndrome, intraocular and intravascular high protein, exudating serial and hemorrhage and retinal necrosis, and suggestion of a uh, hyperviscosity syndrome. And there's that uh, fibrinoproliferative proliferative lesion, which we talked about, usually associated with systemic hypertension, um, but uh, not exclusively. I guess we, 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 we've we learned that. So the cardiac lesions and the systemic car cardiovascular disease could be because of the um, um, hyperviscosity syndrome where, you know, there's just a um, cardiac failure due to difficulty in moving things around, moving the blood around, let's put it that way. And, you know, even though they uh, mention the suspicion of a multiple myeloma, we don't always, or I would say rarely see the neoplastic cells in the eye when uh, there is a uh, hyperviscosity syndrome and uh, the ocular changes tend to be because of the hyperviscosity syndrome rather than the neoplastic infiltration. All right. The next one is, and last one, is an 11 year, seven month old Bengal Siberian mixed tiger. So, um, you know, the people usually say that dogs are not just larger cats, but tigers are larger cats. Um, and a lot of the ocular pathology we see with tigers are very, very similar to what we see with our, with their uh, domesticated brethren. So they describe both thomas non-healing corneal ulcers with associated neovascularization and corneal edema, uh, dilated non-responsive pupil, and unable to assess the deeper structures. Um, it also, see, has mild kidney disease and hyperthyroidism. 
uh, it's an indoor, outdoor, I'm joking. <laughs> Exclusively indoor. Okay, so what we have here, it's a globe. Uh, it's like a cat globe, even the fundus. Uh, markedly edematous cornea. We have the iris leaflets, uh, kind of an opaque cataractus looking lens and a detached and torn retina. Oops, don't give it up. <laughs> That's just a taste of what's coming. You can see the optic nerve there and a detached and torn and kind of folded up retina. So let's take a look at it. Now, if that small mouse eye uh, was great for the sub rows, this is gonna be the total opposite because it's enormous. Okay, so just so we get oriented. Cornea, you can see already there's some changes in the cornea. We have the iris leaflets, cataractus lens, and kind of a liquefied vitreous and the optic nerve here in the back. A um, little bit of a fold, and you can see kind of strands of retina exiting from that optic nerve and you can follow it peripherally. You find some of that retina coming around, some of that retina coming around over here. And right away, even on some growth, you can see that there's a rounded edge there. So there's a retinal tear. Okay. So, marked vascularization, fibroplasia of the corneal stroma. There is some corneal stromal hemorrhage, some lymphocytes and plasma cells also present. You can see that there's very large vessels throughout and um, kind of a remodeling of that superficial corneal stroma. There are, there are areas of ulceration. We're getting close to one right here. And you can see there's a little bit of a uh, free, there are free edges or free floating flaps of epithelium with loss of polarity. Uh, this is a beautiful example of it here. Uh, I don't know where or how it attaches back to the corner, but it's definitely attached there. And you can see the loss of epithelial polarity. Uh, so that is consistent with an indolent ulcer. Um, there's keratinization and somewhat atrophy yeah. of the remaining epithelium, more ulcers and neutrophils. Yep, I'm getting there. There's not much there. And there is a little bit of a sequestral formation here. It's kind of cute. That is hyper eosinophilic surface right there. So I, I told you, it is a large cat. Marked edema, there are some sub epithelial bullae. Um, there is a Pre-read of fibrovascular membrane with a peripheral anterior synechia, so PIFM in a pass. Uh, the contractually obliged lymphoplasmocytic anterior uveitis, just like the cats, the smaller ones. Um, the other iris defects, the same. There is a cataract. Uh, you can see some distortion, mineralization of the lens, formation of more gagging and globules. Uh, so chronic cataract. The vitreous is somewhat liquefied. And you can see it's plastered against the posterior lens capsule. And the cool thing, here's the retina, or the artist formerly known as retina. Here's the optic nerve. There's cupping and atrophy of the optic nerve. And you can see the retina is markedly atrophied, um, sometimes to the point where you know, there are multiple tears and you can get some of these islands of retinal tissue floating around, almost naked vessels, right? Um, so a chronically detached and atrophied retina. And when you get to the periphery, uh, there was a free floating piece here that looked pretty cool. Yeah, so here's peripheral retina. So here's a rounded edge, as I showed you guys on subgrowth. So confirming the retinal tear that we all knew, but there's a beautiful kind of very severe retinoschisis, right? Which in cats and, and a lot of the animals we usually associate with a chronically detached retina. A lot of it is also gliosis too. If you get a little closer, you see that you got some uh, individualized cells or nuclei and a lot of that kind of stretching all the way around. These are probably Miller cells. 
So there's Miller cell gliosis going all the way through. So putting it all together, um, it really fits with a blunt, like a chronic blunt trauma. And oh, and I forgot to show you something. Well, there was market angle recession uh, in both of those angles. So market angle recession and neuroconeal angle fibrosis, multiple iris epithelial cysts, everything is in red in cats are consistent with uh, blunt trauma or chronic trauma, complete retinal detachment tear, metamoschesis, and a segmental full thickness retinal atrophy. The lymphoplasma city viatis is idiopathic, could be related to that cataract, could be just as what we see in cats. And there was a secondary glaucoma here, which likely caused by the fibrovascular membranes and the angle recession and fibrosis. So at some point, this Bengal Siberian mixed tiger got involved in an altercation or hit something and developed a blunt chronic trauma. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, I guess I hope you guys enjoyed and uh, we'll see you in two weeks.